really exploding while it's doing it. Yes, you, you the, really the see towers the building especially, yes. crumbling to dust as it's coming straight down into the path of greatest resistance, which physical structures simply do not do according to the laws of physics. What about the temperatures at which uh, jet fuel burns and steel weakens? Can we, uh, can we address some of those aspects? Oh, definitely. Uh, the, the jet fuel is, is uh, kerosene. Kerosene can't get any hotter than 1400 F. Uh, that's a really, really conservative yeah. estimate of temperature of it a of a controlled mostly, burn. Mostly can't even in, get under six. In, or in the real world, million. jet fuel is a, a, approximately, I, I believe, about 90 percent kerosene, and kerosene in an air burn burns just over 600 degrees Fahrenheit. If you Add that, added that to something that could really take the temperature burn higher, in the real world, the absolute most you're going to achieve is around 800 degrees Fahrenheit. And the, the fires burning at the World Trade Center definitely did not get any hotter than around eight to 900 degrees. And that's, like I said, that's a high conservative estimate. And we know the melting temperature of steel is well over 2750 F. Uh, and there's no way a jet fuel fire can make a temperature that high. Right. The, the melting point of steel is 2,750 degrees Fahrenheit. But um, there is a temp. Now, people will debate and say, well, steel weakens. It loses half of its strength and it begins to deform below that. But the temperature at which steel deforms is 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's, again, a high end, conser- uh, a low end conservative estimate. So there is no way these fires could have even possibly reached that number. So that's just to touch on some of the physical aspects of 9-11 from a material science point of view. We'll get more into this on the other side of this break. Fear is the force that closes down human consciousness so that it cannot understand what is being done around it. And that's what we saw on 9-11-01. So we're talking with Daryl Rowland's 9-11 Truth Activists. We're going to be going to the phones soon in this hour. Okay, I'm going to give the phone number to call in once again. 866 841 one zero six five. Once again, the call-in number is eight six six eight four one one zero six five. Call into what on earth is happening and give us your thoughts, Daryl. Let's. Uh, we were talking about the melting point of steel. We were talking about um, how the, the the building simply could not have fallen in the way that we see on that day. I'm going to be going into that in depth next week. But let's look at a, an even more ridiculous aspect of some of the physical uh, details that we were told. How could the force of these massive planes that we say that we're, we're saying they were incinerated? We're told, okay, as they went into these buildings. Yet we find the Islamic red bandanas that the hijackers tied to their head prior to committing this act of suicide in their jihad, and we find passports completely intact that survived the raging fires that melted steel beams and columns in the buildings, some of the thickest steel beams ever constructed in the United States. I mean, sure. ha- a With, child, uh, you'd have to be a child to believe a tale like this. Yeah, absolutely. They, they uh, were, uh, were not above planting uh, uh, false evidence at the crime scene uh, to, uh, you know, <laughs> make it really... Uh, uh, a ridiculous uh, cover-up. And there you have, uh, in, in Flight 93, there's, like, nothing there. It's, it's a hole in the ground. That's all there's there. But but there's, they're, they claim they find a, a red bandana there. Could, planes incinerate when they hit the ground, Daryl. Didn't you know that? <laughs> you know? Yeah. The, the, the contact with the ground makes all of the steel and the other construction materials that planes are made out of just vanish into nothingness. And then, you know, an, an intact passport found on the street for, uh, you know, uh, Muhammad Atta or uh, Marwan al-Shehi and the... And <laughs> 
<laughs> on the ground. What uh, also laminated uh, plastic will survive, but uh, but steel and concrete would not. We're going to get into uh, a lesser known aspect of. 9-11, at least by the general public, our listening audience will probably be aware of Building 7. But before we do that, you had a connection that you wanted to bring up uh, regarding... Um, oh, yes. Omaha. The okay. Omaha connection. Go right ahead. There is an Omaha, Nebraska connection with 9-11. So George Bush, okay, he first, when, when 9-11 happens, he's in Florida at a school. Now, this in itself is... is uh, uh, egregious, you know, violation of, of uh, you know, logic where Bush uh, is should have been whisked out of there for his safety. Yeah, he was allowed to stay there after they it, knew that this event public, was going on. His location was publicly known. How was he to assume that he would be safe uh, unless he knew of, of the attack? It, it's, it's quite symbolic as well from a PSYOP perspective. He's there with the innocent school children on that day. And uh, he's also reading a story, My Pet Goat, which has occult overtones. We'll get back into that, and I want to hear more about this Omaha connection that you have researched in depth on the other side of this break. Don't go anywhere, folks. You're listening to What on Earth is Happening. Welcome back, folks. You're listening to What on Earth is Happening. I'm Mark Passio. My website, whatonearthishappening.com. We're talking about 9-11 as an inside job. An example of chaos sorcery. The 14th and final methodology of mind control and probably the heaviest gun that the mind controllers use to go to work on people through an injection of fear. I'm here in studio with 9-11 Truth activist from Philadelphia, Daryl Rollins. And we're talking about a lot of different aspects of 9-11. We could do 20 shows on this topic. There is so much data and details to be looked into. However, I'm not going to spend too much time on this aspect of it because, as everyone is well aware, my forte is in looking at the occult aspects behind the scenes and the symbolism. So I'm going to do a lot of focus on that. Next week, for the left-brained among us, I will be presenting the physics equations necessary to understand that this event, as we have told that it happened, as we have been told that it happened, is physically impossible against the laws of nature. So for uh, scientists, architects, engineers, anybody who's extremely left-brained, I will be presenting for the layman, even so that the layman can understand it, with plenty of slides to go along with it, the physics equations of dynamics that are necessary to solve to know that the, the official story is complete bunk. That's coming up next week. So, Daryl, let's go back to uh, some elements of... Let's, let's look at um, this Omaha connection that you have researched, and then let's t- talk about Building 7, and then we're going to go to the phones. Cool. Yeah, I know. It's, it, I'm, folks, it's, it's like all over the place because there is just so many aspects of this, uh, of this uh, PSYOP, this inside job that, to cover. It, it's, but I'm going to try to really speak. I'm going to try to really summarize up this, this Omaha connection. All right, so George Bush, he, when, once he left the Booker Elementary School in Florida, he went to Omaha. He flew to, to, to Omaha to meet with Warren Buffett, the second richest man on earth, uh, at a charity event that he uh, scheduled for that day at uh, Offutt Air Force Base. Now, the odd thing about this is that uh, Ann Tatlock was the CEO of uh, Fiduciary Trust, and she was flown to this meeting uh, in advance also. And uh, this is a quote from Forbes magazine from October 15th, of 2001. Quote, Ann Tatlock found out about the collision of a plane with the North Tower of the World Trade Center while en route to the U.S. Strategic Command Headquarters in Omaha. The 62-year-old chief executive of Fiduciary Trust Company International was one of a small group of business leaders at a charity event hosted by Warren Buffett. Military officers boarded the bus she was on and escorted her to an officer's lounge and a television just in time to see the second plane hit the South Tower between the 87th and 93rd floors, right where 650 of her employees worked. 
fiduciary trusts, which today manages $44 billion of securities for pension plans, endowments, and wealthy individuals. Unquote. So she was on the board also of Merck, Sharp and Dome, and Howard Hughes Medical Center, and uh, also on the board of directors of Franklin, uh, Franklin Resources, based in San uh, Mateo, owned the company Fiduciary Trust, which had offices where Flight 175 hit the South Tower. So, again, uh, you have uh, Thomas Kane uh, involved in this also. He was the, one of the chief 9-11 commissioners. He had long served as director of Fiduciary Trust and Franklin Resources. Uh, and uh, Franklin acquired Fiduciary Trust five months before the World Trade Center uh, uh, was destroyed, and they profited handsomely from the tragedy. Only five months before the attacks, mutual fund firm Franklin bought Fiduciary, a 70-year-old asset manager catering to high net worth clients and in institutional investors, for $825 million. Uh, so right there, I mean, you have uh, George Bush showing up at this meeting uh, where Ann Tatlock is, is going, oh my goodness, 650 of my employees are dead, and here's Warren Buffett, and here's George Bush, and it's at a military base at a secret location, uh, you know, <laughs> away from the public, uh, and I would love to know what went on in that meeting, wouldn't you folks? Now, uh, Mark, what, did you, what else did you want to talk about? Well, I want to get into the whole Building 7 scenario, because a lot of people still don't aren't aware that a third building came down into its own footprint in New York City on the day of 9-11 at 5.20 in the afternoon. It was struck by no plane. It had very little damage that was done to it by uh, debris from the collapsing towers, although people debate that and say that's what caused this perfectly symmetrical collapse, which I will uh, link um, footage uh, to in the podcast for this, uh, for this uh, show. And um, I want to look at the owner of the World Trade Center and his comments on why was Building over. 7 was, so, was allegedly pulled, his words, not mine, a demolition term. Um, I want to look at um, you know, how he cleaned up in insurance claims as part of uh, the, the, uh, the uh, fallout fr from the 9-11 event. And uh, let's look at how the, the BBC announced that the building had come down before it even came down. They sure. said that it already happened. So tell people about Building 7, what, what was housed in that building, um, how it came down, and uh, some of the uh, aspects of that that people need to be made aware of. Sure. In Building 7 was housed uh, SEC records uh, of the Enron scandal, uh, which uh, were conveniently destroyed that day. So what is the SEC? The, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Okay. Uh, and uh, you, you also had offices of the CIA in, in that building. Uh, lots of, you know, damning information was destroyed during that operation. In, in the control center, which was housed in the middle oh, of yes, the building. Oh, yes, on the 23rd, 23rd floor, floor was uh, Rudy Giuliani's special uh, uh, counterterrorism uh, floor. It was hermetically sealed. Another uh, occult number, folks, the number 23, which we'll get into. We'll get into all of the numerology of the event on the future, a future show where we talk about the occult aspects, but continue about Building 7. Yeah, um, and uh, so at 5.15 or 5.20 p.m. that day at 9-11, uh, this building suddenly uh, collapses straight down in 6.5 seconds into its own footprint, and you even see the penthouse of the building sink down into the top of the building as it's coming down. And you see the floors staying in mm -hmm. the same um, uh, the same proportion, the same distance from each other as it comes down. You get the idea that Flight 93 was supposed to hit Building 7, uh, but it crashed or was shot down. It looks like it was shot down. Uh, Anyway, they had to go. Along. They had to go forward with it because they had so much evidence they had to destroy. Uh, so uh, anyway, they they had a script, you know. And uh, so one of the script readers was this uh, reporter for BBC World. Uh, her name was Jane Stanley. And uh, there you see uh, at uh, around 4:50 p.m.